Good. So, very much welcome. Today's webinar is about tackling with problems or how to nail jelly to the wall. And we hope that as learning outcomes, you take away on understanding, uh, developing an understanding of the weakness of problems more generally and specifically to understand what are weak problems that linear cause and effect logic is not sufficient to tackle them. We will also discuss some examples of weak problems and how to work with them. And we will look into available methods and techniques to research and potentially resolve weak problems. And at the end, we will run the breakout session to which you are very much invited uh, to participate. If you don't wish so, you obviously also can leave at that point in time. Um, so let's start over with what are wicked problems. Now, in a nutshell, there's something difficult to define because uh, different stakeholders have different versions of what the problem is. And no one version is complete or verifiable, right or wrong. They're evolving and continuously changing. And there are no clear solutions. And only proxy solutions might become available, but they are not verifiably right or wrong, but rather better or worse. And there are many interdependencies, multiple causes, and conflicting goals. And it's socially complex rather than technically complex. Um, and it cannot be treated with linear and analytical approaches alone. Now, if we look and compare tame versus rigged problems, a traditional or a tame problem um, is clearly broke, and it's very clear on how to fix it if you just think about it um, hard enough. Uh, on the other hand, for wicked problems, there's no general agreement, and the solution is not true or false. And something that might be problematic today is not seen to be problematic tomorrow, or perhaps not to the same stakeholder. So it's constantly changing situation. And you could say that as a rule of thumb, whenever humans are involved, the situation quickly can turn out wicked. As said, wicked problems are not that much about technical, but rather about human, so they might also be socio-technical. Um, that very much depends, and there are also different shades of weakness in the problems. So when both problem and solution are clear, then it's very much a tame problem, but as neither solution or problem is clear and as more parties are involved, as more complex it will become. So, and what also should not be forgotten is that our understanding about what are wicked problems is emerging over time. And at currently, we have an understanding that wicked problems very much also will relate to systemic rigidities and past dependency, which means that the history matters and impacts on what can be done in the future. If we just think about one of the big topics uh, like climate change, there we are very much limited today in the actions we can take based upon what happened in the past. So um, the concept of past dependency is currently also emerging for once we look at wicked problems. So it's not a simple thing. It's an evolutionary process of how we view wicked problems and how we approach them and also research them. Right, let's move into the second part. Are there any problems so far? Uh, any questions? Okay, good. Now, the problems can be tame, complex, and wicked. And if we look on the right side, uh, we see a lot of messy stuff, which uh, shown a lot of unknown effects. We, meanwhile, in the middle part, we see known effects and look at tame problems, and their cause and effects are pretty much definable and can be understood and studied. So in a linear approach, it's quite clear what a problem constitutes and how to fix it. The only things that must be done is to look hard enough at it, to analyze it, to identify all of the cause and effects, and then uh, to decide based upon the literature how to approach the problem. Now, contrary to this, um, if we look here at the left side, we see a messy situation where 
a lot of stakeholder engagement is needed. However, the one is not abolishing the other, which means that always will be also linearity within a wicked problem. And therefore, we can work on both ends in parallel. And if you see the right side, for example, uh, it shows the traditional cause and effect logic. So we can bring both sides together and use the right side in support of engaging the stakeholders at the left side, means to provide them with some structure and robustness, so to approach a wicked problem. And we will come to that uh, in the later part of the webinar. Now, what are examples of wicked problems? Um, I've put forward three examples. Uh, the first one starting with a very well um, understood example, the healthy school lunch case. Now, the school decides that they no longer want to offer unhealthy foods. But however, as a consequence, uh, the kids take their money and buy food somewhere else. And uh, the ultimate consequence is that the dietary of the kids is even worse than it was before. Now, this is a result of a quick action where only one part of the problem has been looked at, but not the entire context. So it was very much too narrow and the multiple causes have not been considered. Um, another, perhaps not so obvious, problem are high unemployment rates. Now, uh, we here in Portugal had twice to experience over the past 20 years, very high levels of, unex of unemployment rates. And the last, last time in 2010, um, it was at a time where um, we just started our company and high unemployment rates uh, actually, as a matter of fact, were great for us. Uh, the government put together a lot of support programs. Uh, there were a lot of people unemployed that were willing to work for little money. And since our customers were abroad, uh, this didn't impact as much. Furthermore, um, there were not that many tourists here. So there were a lot of promotions. Things were generally speaking much cheaper, housing market, everything. So it depends on where you are, um, on what you see as being problematic. Now in 2018, shortly before the COVID, until shortly before COVID kicked in, the situation was very differently. Porto had become a tourist a top destination. Prices here are very high. Um, low level of unemployment and so forth means uh, the situation is less desirable uh, if you are on the right side or the wrong side in this case. So this is very subjective and you need to map out all of the different um, criteria so to understand what is problematic and what not. In this case here, we looked at the individuals, at entrepreneurs, at economic matters, environmental aspects, social aspects, and housing market investment. But there will be many more that could be looked at. Now, for several years, I've been also working in organizational development, and there was one organization which I had uh, the chance of working with, which was a research organization, and they struggled to attract research funding. Now, research organizations depend on funding. This, therefore, was a clear problem. Um, however, the leadership team uh, was selecting on the strategy that they just would push staff to write more proposals. However, staff was motivated to write proposals. Therefore, the quality of the proposals was not that good. Moreover, there were serious issues in the leadership and those that knew how to write proposals didn't share the knowledge and they didn't help to build up capacity. Human resource department, on the other hand, did not understand what the real issue was and why the quality level was so low because they only assumed they need to train the non-research staff because researcher would be that well skilled that they know all by heart and that there is no need for developing them further. The business developing department failed to see that the quality standards of funding proposals were too low. I mean, they saw that they were not going through, but they didn't see and understood that the researchers were well aware that low proposals are still good enough because they still would count for the KPI. So they continued producing low quality proposals, which are pretty pointless at the end. And the little value that the organization managed to create, they did not manage to capture. 
It was lost afterwards because there was no way to capture the knowledge created in the organization. So this is a very complex situation. And if you look at all of the different parts, you can clearly see that there are different issues beneath. You can see that there are behavioral, leadership, staffing, strategy, management, knowledge, ability, communication, staffing, a lot of different scientific disciplines that you could choose so to analyze parts of the problem, either in its entirety or in its parts. So this is a very complex situation. However, if you analyze the parts individually, they can all be very well understood. The only thing that you might need for that is time. So let's move into the fourth part, um, how to work with big problems. Let's first start from some basics again. Now, there's no quick fix and safe method to resolve the situation. And there might not even be a way to resolve it. And the only thing that really helps to get things solved are collaborative approaches, which means you need to engage with the stakeholders. However, stakeholder engagement is only crucial at one point in time. We've seen the example before. If you would engage stakeholders too early, then you don't have the knowledge at hand to engage them on what? And you don't have the structure and robustness that they might need to be effective. So you might risk of tackling only a sub-problem and you can't provide them with a full picture. Therefore, stakeholder engagement, yes, but the timing must be just right. And as much as the timing must be right, the question and focus must be right. Um, which, as a matter of fact, is not unique to big problems, but entirely inherent to research as such. Now, if you have an outcome expectation based question, then you work over luck. For example, asking a question like, what should we do? This is openly inviting speculation. However, that will not provide you with a desired path on which you want to go because you would want to rather move into the criteria-based questioning, which will provide you with a much better structuring. And let us see for the example of the healthy school lunch case, how such a difference look. Now, outcome-based expectation, reasoning and actions argues over we want, therefore. So you skip out all of the analytical parts. Meanwhile, criteria-based reasoning brings in exactly the analytics, and this is what you want to have. If you follow this line of thinking, you would first check what food is being served at the canteen. You would identify the meals that are seen to be less healthy. You would locate the ingredients that are seen to be less healthy, seek out alternate healthier ingredients that could provide the same taste, engage with parents and kids to agree on a balanced weekly menu. You see at which late point, the engagement with parents here only comes 0.5. So it's crucial to understand exactly at which point to engage with which stakeholders. You obviously would first start at point one to look over the menu. So if you don't have an understanding of what the menu is, you would need to engage with the kitchen. So whom you engage at which point in time is crucial and relevant. And then at six points, you would change the weekly menu and collect regular stakeholder satisfaction feedback and it adapted further as appropriate. So as I said, it's crucial the point in time on which to engage with the stakeholders. And at that point in time, you want to have built up already some good understanding about the problem. And this understanding should ideally allow you to visualize the problem or to communicate it in a way that the stakeholders can engage and can understand the problem and can come on board and help you to further define and develop the problem. For defining the problem and working it out, mapping approaches are very suitable and can help stakeholders to quickly come on board. And we will look into this later further. Now, one thing, however, that you might also want to understand is when tackling a big problem is going wrong, and stakeholders are not satisfied, it's you as a person who will be 
blamed and culprit. So therefore, you might anticipate consequences and possible reactions and mitigation strategies, and only then engage in any actions. And yes, remaining inactive is a real option. As Peter Lawrence said, some problems are so complex that you have to be highly intelligent and well-informed just to be undecided about them. So remaining inactive is a viable option and walking away might be a good decision. Now, we come into the fifth and final part where we will look a bit more into the methods and techniques on how to research and potentially resolve big problems. And we will look here on two in three possible means, and out of that, one more in detail. Now, we already looked into mapping as being one good way of working with rigged problems, and there are clear guides on how to do this. Working over the messy parts and mapping out the messes is a clear way forward, and we already have shown at the slide before that posted, could be a good mean of doing so. However, in digital times, we might also make use of technology and software and map out the dialogues on the left side. You see, for example, uh, a tool used from the Knowledge Media Institute at the Open University UK. I don't think that this tool is any longer available. It was called Compendium. However, um, there are other tools that are freely available such as the C mapping tool from IJMC. It's free available for you to download and work with, and it works with Windows, Mac, and on Linux. And it provides you with a digital version of mapping out the problem, and you can do it also collaboratively. Now, those are techniques that could be used for approaching the big problem. Um, at the doctor tab, what we have been doing, we have broken the steps down into an eight weeks course, which is available for free safe study with peer support or also fully tutored or with flexible on demand feedback in the case needed. And let's go through the eight steps. At first, you want to work out the problem and issue statement. Now, this is not unique to WIC problems. I think it's always important that you have an initial good understanding and verbalization of what the exact issue or problem is that you're dealing with. So WIC problems are not difficult to set. As said, they are just more messy, so you might not be able to be as precise to initially describe and detail the problem. And that's fair and fine enough. As a second step, you might want to map out and understand what is happening, what are the different parts of the problem, their apparent relations, and also what is known from the literature about such different parts and about the apparent relations. The literature and the practice, I think, come in hand in hand. The literature will guide you and the practice will provide you with further evidence. So working on both ends in parallel might be advisable. And mapping it out, be it either in an analog way or in a digital way, under the involvement of stakeholders at one point in time, is a good point to do. Now, we have said here as step two that the stakeholders already start coming in. As said, it might not be as early as that, or it might not be all type of stakeholders, as the school case has shown. Now, as a third step, you might see and understand what can be looked at, which type of different scientific disciplines are there and which priorities to understand and which priorities exist and why. As more precise as you can be, as better you will understand the problem and as more you can engage stakeholders and you will understand at which point in time. Now, this example here shows uh, that there are basic dimensions, that there are causal categories that could be identified, that there are more detailed dimensions, and it looks at the scale of witness. Now, this provides you just with an idea on classifications and groupings that might be adopted, so that ultimately will depend very much on the case that you are looking at. Now, once it comes to the state, 
stakeholder identification, you might want to see which are the stakeholders, are they the same for the different parts of the problem, and what are the techniques and methods that the literature provides us with on how to engage them. And there are quite some actually like this one, which very neat and nicely shows that there are very different ways and different points in times on how to engage with the stakeholders and it all starts with settling on a strategy. And after you settled on a strategy, you can move on and say, and identify and map out when, how, and why you want to engage the stakeholders and what for. So it's important to map that out first before you engage in any actions. And once you start to engage the stakeholders, you might want to document the way they are impacted by the problem or problem um, domain or part of the problem. And once you document that, you will be able to move further and identify commonalities and themes and groupings. And at one point in time, it will allow you to get more specific and to outline um, how the interactions and the different part of the problems relate to each other. This was this diagram was taken from a EU project and um, it's highly recommended to look into the stakeholder analysis and engagement reports that they were putting together because it provides a very neat and nicely overview on how they worked and you might um, be able to adapt something. So in order to move from the left side of this example, organizational struggle into the right side on getting a clear understanding of the problem. As I said, there are many guides out there and this allows you actually to work in a very um, structured manner, despite the fact that the problem is messy and perhaps by times demanding and difficult to understand. Now, as we are halfway through the eight steps, eight steps sounds like it's a linear thing. However, it's not. Um, please understand development of the problem understanding will only gradually increase and stakeholder engagement and analysis will go hand in hand. And as said earlier, development of the problem understanding and consultation of the literature and identification of the literature also is something front and back. So it's certainly clearly not linear. However, there will be linearity in it. Um, it goes both together and please do understand that. Um, however, we provided and broken things down in this eight step course. So to provide um, learners with some better guidance and to reduce the complexity as much as possible for learning purposes. Now, step five, stakeholder engagement. Um, you, once you engage the stakeholders, you would want to engage them on their perceptions and how to approach and cope with the problem. Again, you might want to adopt a problem-based focus and not a solution-based focus that works over I want therefore, but rather much about the criteria and what is not working. So it's, it's critical important to work over that way. And if you want to get some inspiration on how this could be done, then you might check out from Tom the draw toast approach, which uh, shows which, which shows was a nice and neat toast drawing exercise on how a common understanding and shared view can be worked out and uncovered. Um, it's very nice to see that. Likewise, if you want to understand how quickly nodes can grow and start to look messy, you might want to look into this um, slideshow, which was provided uh, by Ro Rochelle Sturvant and shows nicely how quickly a problem can evolve from very simple to very complex. Now, at one point in time, you might want to come to understand what are the observable patterns and themes. And so to move from simply drawing a toast into getting things together and mapping it out to have all ingredients and understanding together. And once you are at this point, I think what is critical important, which is important for each research project you undertake is to settle on the analytical approach because depending on your framework and choice the research and analysis might go very um, 
in very different ways. If you look, for example, here into the left slide, figure five, contrasting mental models. If you work within an organization, you could view the organization as an obedient machine that just needs to function, or you could see it as an adaptive system that is a result of how things have been working out in the past and who at this point in time is there and what are the shared views on where it should be in the future. Recall the past dependency we looked at in the earlier part of the webinar. It's exactly going here once we are seeing an organization as an adaptive system. So, yeah, analytical approach will very much matter on how you progress and how you afterwards will present your results. And it is an outcome that we see here that is based on the earlier choices. Now, as a seventh step, you might want to decide uh, what are the means of tackling the RICT problem and what are the lessons from the literature that you might can use so to tame it. And doing so, I came across those three strategies in an oversimplified way that could be uh, adopted. A holistic strategy to resolve WIC problems, a taming strategy to reduce the WIC problems, or a coping strategy so to learn how to live with it. Now, having said that, um, the same source from Davita also provided a very nice statement, which I think we should be well aware about. WIC problems are called WIC for a reason. Debating how to tackle this type of problems, Wexler wants, invites knowledge types and false assurances. It motivates those in the business of selling solutions to downplay the intractable and unsolvable nature of these problems. Now, WIC problems are called WIC problems for a reason because there exists no solution. And what I think in this quote is very important to recall is a solution hype, very much indeed uh, hype Solutions are hyped and much of what you read and come in contact with, uh, likely 99% and more, will tackle things and deal things and promote things from a solution-based perspective. And this is really not the, work, the way science works. Uh, you want to work and to learn to work over the problem. And, and if you think that you might still are not knowing the difference between a problem or a solution, please be invited to take a look at a earlier webinar we were giving on that matter, or also to look into our problematizing course, which will allow you to train how to work over the problem-based end. Now, as an eighth and final step, um, you might want to take a decision what you want to do. Will you want to act to sense, to response, to stay intact, inactive or to walk away? As said, staying inactive or walking away, a very sensible option and it all depends on how you interpret the problem, where you locate yourself, where you locate the stakeholders, and what that implies for the actions that are to be taken or not. Um, and with this, we move into the group activity part of the webinar. And that also means that we will stop the